Greetings and welcome to In the Trees, the cannabis, gardening, and lifestyle podcast highlighting methods, products, growers, and breeders from Maine, the East Coast, and beyond. I'm your host, Mr. Roots, and I'm stoked to deliver you the lowdown on all things cannabis. Presented not just for the well-vetted OGs in the garden, but for those buying a seed pack to grow their very first garden. This show is especially for those buying their very first cannabis to try. If you are listening in your car, sit back, relax, and strap on your seatbelt. And if you are listening in the garden, turn us up so you can hear us over the fans. Sending out good vibes from the rock-bound coast of Maine, we are in the trees. All right, here we are, episode five of In the Trees podcast, with the second part of High Striker Farms interview as the main course. Before we get into part two, we have cooked up something nice for you. In the canopy. As above, so below. From soil to oil. From the roots to the fruits. The cycles of life in the gardens we love. With the plants with which we care. This is the knowledge that we share. In the Trees Cannabis Podcast would like to thank the Maine Cannabis Chronicle for sponsoring the show. If you haven't had the opportunity to check out their magazine, you should ask your local caregiver store, dispensary, or grow store if they have a copy of it. If they don't, request that they carry it. The Maine Cannabis Chronicle is a great source of knowledge on all things related to the high quality herb here in Maine. This is a beautifully edited, full color, well done magazine full of captivating articles from some of the best in the business today. Grab a copy and give it a read. The Grateful Duplex of Mandalorian Genetics joins us for this gardening-based discussion today to dish the history of autoflower genetics. Full Duplex is a well-respected, long-time breeder of amazing autoflowers and also one of the founders of the autoflower forum site, autoflower.net which has tons of comprehensive forums on growing and breeding autoflower genetics. He also won second place last year in the autoflower cup with his acetone terped cross, Bobby's Widow, which I am personally grateful to have grown in the center bed of my greenhouse this year. Super nice stuff. All this makes Full Duplex of Mandalorian Genetics one of the very best people I know to give you the lowdown on how autoflowers started making their way on the cannabis scene, and also why they are so important for today's gardeners. So here he is, dropping knowledge from the great state of Washington, Full Duplex of Mandalorian Genetics. I definitely can see more farms in the future trying to figure out a way to bump up production with lower overhead costs. And at the end of the day, these will meet that need. Right, right. (laughs) All right, today we have Dan from Mandalorian Genetics joining us via phone conference in the Alight Studio. Dan, so glad to have you on, man, and stoked to chat with you. Well, I really appreciate you having me on, man. I enjoy talking and looking forward to the conversation. It's been nice to connect with you and do this a little bit more formally. I wanted to ask you, in uh, the modern cannabis scene, autoflowers are getting a lot of press. And uh, I recently read Caleb from CSI Humboldt was giving him the nod. I wanted to check and see if you could talk to us about autoflower genetics and uh, maybe give us some of the history and lowdown. Yeah. 
quick and simple, you know, all the flowers came from Ruderalis. A little bit of the history, you know, is the early days with this. I want to say it was, uh, from what I remember, it was like Joint Doctor or somebody along those lines. In the early days, it had uh, Low Rider 1, Low Rider 2, Auto AK-47. That's where it basically started coming from. And a lot of the Ruderalis initially was, you know, joked about in the community. Most of the time, photo period guys, you know, shrugged off at it, and which is understandable because in the early days, there really wasn't much to bat an eye at. The best way I could describe it is like dorm room weed. You know, you, somewhere you can stash a little plant in your dorm room trying to grow your own. But they've come a long way since then. There were some huge influential players in the furthering of the Ruder Alice into these modern hybrid autos that we're seeing. And I mean, the way I look at it, it's more of a hybrid these days than like a subspecies, which still it is, but original Ruderalis, if some of you don't know, is a very spindly ditchweed style plant. I mean, it grows wild in like places in Siberia where, you know, it had to figure out a reproductive mechanism in the short growth cycles that they have. Definitely. So pioneers took that, saw the potential in it and have moved it forward. One of the biggest names that I saw early on you know, was a woman by the name of Mossy. And she was a huge advocate to the autoflower community. She had one of the very first fully stable color varieties of any autoflower that was actually on the market at the time. I wasn't highly stable. My original 10 pack of autos that I first bought years and years ago was her purple gem. And of course, out of 10, none of them turned purple. But <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and actually, I've grown out the gem, and maybe one of the most pertinent aspects of that plant is the CBG content. Well, and that's what shocked me, too. You know, that's a mind blower. So I got those, and then I got the graces from her to work that line because I started growing medicinally. You know, it was a way for me to ease pain. I have a lot of anxiety, and there was something about the gem that just worked for me. And uh, I thought it was high in CBD. And then when I finally got the opportunity to get it grown in mass here in Washington, I have access to labs now. I, I have the ability to test and see what's going on. And that's when we found it had 3% CBG post-harvest. You did the FICO extract last year, and, and it was 10%, which was absolutely incredible. Yeah, yeah. That's, I'm that's... pretty sure I printed that one out. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, that, that came in really well. Yeah, shout out to Sheep's Gut Medicinals here in Maine for, for doing the processing on that. From my understanding, someone is going to be making some gummies out of that, potentially. Nice. I think that would be a great way to, you know, assist the medical patient. A lot of people, you know, still are uneasy about consuming through smoking. It seems that more people, especially a little bit older generation, they're more open-minded to it if they have the ability to eat it for consumption. Definitely. And yeah. I think that'll reach out to, you know, more people when it's an easy platform to just say, hey, look, I'm having this, this is going on today. I just reach in my pocket, reach in the fridge or wherever you're keeping them and just pop it and go on about your business, you know? Yeah, definitely. I wanted to check in with you. Maine is a very cold, wet environment, similar, I'm, I'm assuming, to Washington State. I haven't spent a ton of time in Washington State, but I know that you have a pretty damp environment. A lot of the northern belt, it seems to be very similar, just weather patterns and humidity levels. That seems to really point to why autoflowers are amazing to grow. And, and maybe people are seeing that, hey, you don't need to pull tarps. You could get three and four harvests in by using autoflowers. Are you seeing the same? Yes, we are. You know, one of the first forms that I worked with up here, uh, that was the whole reason that they even reached out to me. I got connected to them online by another party, and they wanted to experiment, basically just to see because, you know, it's a full sun grown farm. They have greenhouses, and a couple of them, the one they call an indoor space, but it's not really an indoor space. It's basically just a place that they've got a bunch of lights and the ability to grow in a semi-controlled environment. But the idea was to have quick production, one, two, maybe three, if done right, to offset the loss that they would have by some plants not surviving that late season rain. Right, right. Yeah. So you're seeing people get multiple harvests in with autoflowers there. Absolutely. Two is 
pretty much the average, especially if you, you know, start late April, get them to, to a decent size, and then once your temperatures at night from what I'm seeing up here, now these I'm speaking specific to the cultivars that I've used with other farms and testing and, and my own stuff, uh, just recently our nights were slightly above freezing, not not too long ago, especially in April. And I was running them outside. They slowed down a little bit, but they still continued to grow. So if there was a way for you to get them started a little bit, you know, early, and then around the 1st of March, get them into a hoop house that's outside. It doesn't have to be climate controlled or anything like that. It's just got some exposure. You have some kind of like wind moving to make sure, you know, you're building structural integrity on the plant. But I think you could definitely get a three harvest run out here very easily. Yeah, that would be in Washington. Usually here in Maine, um, March is still freezing temperatures. You know, most people in greenhouses are using supplemental heat and right. and supplemental lighting too per the photo period. Talking about the photo period and starting on autos, uh, do you have a, a a preference for when you're when you're seeing people start these? Yeah, I think a good preference time. The easiest way to just kind of let it do its thing with the less overhead would be after Mother's Day or 1st of June. Um, usually is a good indication. I typically put my photo periods out after Mother's Day. Uh, when I'm going to be growing the big, my big photo periods outside, I'll throw them out after Mother's Day, which is a little later than what I could, but I typically like to watch my light hours. Definitely. A lot of people run into the issue where they spent this time, they popped a pack of seeds, they've grown them out, they found their moms or they found their females, they throw them outside too early and they go into flower. And then they go through a reveg cycle and the stuff gets all wonky. Definitely. Yeah, it can set you back a couple of weeks doing that. Oh, yeah. And it can also set you back your yield, too. I mean, True. plants do weird things when they go through reveg. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So last year, running your auto flowers, I direct seeded in, let's see, I think second week of May. And, you know, have, having running regular auto flowers. So what I did here in Maine is I, I went ahead and just did some quick math in my head and decided that, all right, I may get a 50-50 split male to female ratio. And so I planted out 72 auto flower seeds and it worked out pretty well. In the end, I, I had 36 plants and they, uh, yeah, they were beautiful. It was amazing seeing beautiful colas in July that I wasn't pulling tarps and worrying about humidity when running tons of electricity every day. Right. The simplicity of the lower overhead cost. You know, you basically planted a seed, like you would sow something normal, and you sat back and you watched it grow. And like you said, the fact that you see full colas without pulling tarps, you've saved yourself time, you freed up for other projects, you know, and another thing I think due to the fact that they grow so quickly in I've heard Jeff Lowenfels talk about this and touch on this subject too. The lack of need for heavy IPM because they're moving through such a, a quick phase that even if they do get hit with something, they've moved into the next cycle or you're ready to bring them down. But, you know, I mean, most organic guys like yourself and me and starting to see a huge shift this way in the cannabis world usually have their IPM on point to where there's no concern at all. So, you know, it's, it's nice to see a, a a plant that's producing the same kind of quality flowers photo periods do and half the time with less overhead. And I think that's huge for the industry and why I think a lot of the farms and people are starting to get their toes in the water, start to check it out. Yeah, definitely, man. Yeah. And I think that you're talking about overhead of a grow even further. I really didn't add much for nutrients at all, the whole grow cycle on those. Right grow them in the ground they don't need a lot of food and like we were talking the other day that's one of the biggest costs associated with growing is your nutrient load whether it's bottled newts or if you're running dry amendments and compost teas or if you're doing a living soil that you've been building on for the last few years you still have to add a little bit every now and again right yeah not with auto flowers it didn't seem to me you know i uh, the soil that i'd been using was was the year before's living soil in a raised bed i don't think I gave them anything, really. I, I think I just dropped my seeds directly into peat plugs just so I could identify where they all were. And right. the most nerve-wracking thing was using a one-gallon spray bottle to keep the peat plugs moist. 
doing a little bit of nail biting, like, oh, come on, come on. And then, yeah, sure enough, you start seeing sprouts all over the place, and then they're all up, and a few weeks later, you're culling. Right. Anvil and the outline typically take about two and a half weeks to show sex. Uh, sometimes a little longer if they're getting bigger, if they got the root room to go. But, yeah, usually before your third week, you know what you got to do, especially if you got a trained eye. I still, to this day, answer a lot of, is this a male, is this a female question? And I understand that's because there's a lot of new people as the legality movements are moving forward, medical states and recreational states are opening up more. There's a lot of people who always wanted to and really couldn't. And now that they are, you know, they're wanting to see that. And it's nice to know that you can get your males out of the way before they ever become any kind of danger to your female crop. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. And I, I just want to mention that's something I really respect about you and respected about working with your genetics was the transparency and the the level of care you put into describing to me what it was my first autoflower grow. You really took the time to explain to me some details about them that that I was really I'm really thankful for. It looks like on the forums, autoflower.net that, that you are one of the founders of, that's something that's pretty standard practice for you. You know, it's part of the fabric of creating or help creating AFN was to get proper information, success and failure to the people. That way it's precise and they don't have to sift through a bunch of garbage to try to get to what they're looking for. And I often tell people, and I appreciate the fact that you continued to reach out, you had the questions because when people buy my seeds, especially in bulk and especially for farms and stuff like that, part of that price is the assistance if you want it. It's there. I'll at least help you get through your first row. I enjoy conversation. I enjoy talking to people. And I one of the things I often like to tell people is like, you know, reach out to me if you have questions. If you're seeing this, that, or the other, and you're confused about a subject, even if it's not something of mine and you want to know more about autos, reach out. I may not reply within an hour, but I will get back to you. I will reach back out to the individuals because every we only get better if we help. I don't find it right porting information and knowledge on this subject. Right, right. And I can attest to that. You were, you were very helpful with that. Yeah, that was awesome. I wanted to ask you about autoflowers in general, like what made you decide that you were really interested in them? What drew you to them? Uh, because I'm assuming you did a lot of work with regular seeds, maybe even feminized seeds, but you must've had some kind of a, a light bulb go off or something years ago. The very beginning, to be completely honest, I needed something that was stealthy, quick, turnaround medication. And I remember watching the first female grow, because my very first pack of seeds were 10 pack of regs, which myself and a few other guys are the only ones that still produce regs and to this day. And I, it fascinated me at the fact that it eliminated light cycle for me. It eliminated having to have a lot of fertilizers around and trying to understand, you know, what all they did and how they benefited the plant at an early stage. Trying to take all that information when I was starting to grow and cram it all into one grow to be successful was just not overwhelming, but I'm the kind of person who want to try to find a simple solution to get to the same answer that's correct. And autos, from the research in the early days from what I had done, there wasn't much. But what I did find showed the simplicity of the grow. Planted in some good compost with some perlite and water it. And that's basically what drew me to them. And then I saw potential in them very early. I saw something there that if the time was spent in a dedicated, precise manner that they could potentially become something more, and they have. Um, and not just my stuff. There are some phenomenal autoflowers on the market these days. So that brings up an, another talking point. Have you seen either Chemdog autos or Sour Diesel autos that you feel like are definitely true to their regular, regular form? I've seen some out there that are called that. There's a few other companies out there that, you know, spit those names out. I personally haven't grown them. Some people rave about them, but I have not personally grown anything out to where I could truthfully say, yeah, it looks like that. Or I see a lot of name game going on right now. I'm just going to be honest. I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes, but it's just really crazy for me to see last year's cookies cross whatever what the hot topic was to come out the following year 
in a true stable auto form. You talking like, like gelato auto flower? Yeah, like a gelato auto flower or a a Mac uh, auto flower. A Mac, yeah, a Mac auto flower. Or, you know, that's that's true to the form of those things. I just haven't seen anything that you know. To me, that expression would be. If you're going to call it that, it should look like the photo period mother that it came from, bud structure, leaf structure, you know, maybe a little bit varied because you're mixing genetics. But, I mean, if you really want to call it that, I think you should try to at least try to isolate the day-neutral gene as best as you can with your plant selections to eliminate those ruderalis traits that are still hanging in there. Because that stuff's like cancer, for lack of a better term. Once it gets in there, it's in there. So we're talking stability, something that I've noticed with your lines You've got a lot of them at like F5, F6. This is where you're starting to see the stability in autoflower lines that, that you're talking about. Correct. You know, I was selected based upon, I mean, I got quite a mix of a hodgepodge of genetic backgrounds in them. But once I found what I wanted, usually I start to see the things balancing out at around five and six. Uh, sometimes it'll happen at four. You'll get quite a bit of, you know, similar plants at four. But five and six is really where they start. Males start looking like females, structurally wise, flower density wise. Everything just starts to kind of balance out. Yeah, very cool. So, can you walk us through the uh, Bobby's widow that you won second place at the Autoflower Cup with? Yeah, yeah, she's um, relatively new to my stable. I was working with a Bobby's girl, and I had a white widow from Dynafem that I had around just to grow it out and test them. I'd never grown any of their autos, so I had that white widow auto up, and I had Bobby's girl auto up, and the problem was Bobby's girl was seeds from about eight years prior, and I opened them up. They germinated. A couple of them dampened off, and I was left with one out of the group that I had. And I didn't want to lose the genetic code because that plant had a unique trait of super dark black leaves, but a very resinous covered green flower. And the contrast really spoke to my eye. There was something about that that was unique. It was reversed from, like, say, amble. You know, some of the ambles do get dark leaf, but they do have a purple flower. But it was just the contrast that piqued me. So I didn't want to lose that code, so I pollinated the, the white widow. And that's how she was born. Uh, complete fluke uh one of those things where you know the only cross you regret making is the one that you don't do yeah so i went for it and the first generation the f1s came out started growing them and lo and behold she was a lot frostier than what the white widow mom was actually probably twice as much resin coverage because instead of it just being on the flower it was actually pushing it out beyond the sugar leaf into the secondary this recent generation is pushing it out to the main fans, which is the first time I've ever personally seen that in an auto flower in my grow room. There are some out there that are doing that, but when I saw that resin production coming out, I was like, okay, this one definitely needs to be chased down. So at the cup, the flower that I had was the F2 flower, I believe, and they are now in an F3 version that's actually getting released through Regenerative Seed Co., Got the package out to him, and of course, with everything going on right now, things shipping times are delayed, so those should be coming out. But yeah, it's really, it's a quick plant. She is harvestable between 57 and 60 days. The earliest I've taken them is at 53, but a good safe average would be between 57 and 60. Yeah, that's a nice um, good turnaround. Yeah, super quick. She gets really, really, she sexes early, anywhere, anywhere between... 12 and 14 days and then she kind of puts she puts on all of her biomass through the stretch and i mean quickly and branches really heavily which is really really nice the buds on it are dense extremely dense i was actually showing a fellow grower here the other day i got the harvest done on this f3 flower which i'm still going to go get tested once our labs open back up get it tested that way i can get content but he asked me if i was using plant growth regulators and chemical kind yeah. and i said no i don't use any kind of pgrs i use everything as water only and it you know gathers all of its nutrient from the soil yeah my interest is peaked on that bobby's widow i gotta say and it seems like it's grabbed quite the, the attention of quite a few people just from 
resin coverage to bud density to turf profile. I've had several guys test grow it. One of the um, gentlemen of the Underground Gardens works with the uh, Green Sunshine Company. It's a LED lighting company. And a little shout out to those guys. They hooked me up with their earth dust. Got to give them a little bit of credit. And he recently just did some testing with the Bobbies in their autoflower mix and told me the rosin smelled like chemical pineapples. Ooh, that sounds good. Yeah. So that five or six guys grow out the F2. A couple people grow out the F3s and they've been pretty pleased. Fantastic. This is going to be a beneficial thing to not only just the home grower, but to the commercial grower. Do I see it overtaking the photo period world? No, because we need those elites to keep the diversity amongst the gene pool. The next time you're on Weed Maps, type in All Kind and give them a follow. All Kind is a medical caregiver storefront in downtown Portland, Maine, specializing in finely crafted infused Belgian chocolate and other tasty cannabis edibles and products. We are proudly supported by All Kind and personally love their high quality products. Check them out at allkind.buzz on Instagram or go to their website, allkind.buzz, to check out their great selection. Listeners of the show receive a 10% discount by mentioning In the Trees podcast to your bud tender at all kind. Special thanks to Full Duplex of Mandalorian Genetics for providing his first-hand history on autoflowers. Check him out on Instagram at Mandalorian underscore genetics and look for his amazing autoflower strains at fine seed vendors like Oregon Elite Seeds and DC Seed Exchange. Okay, here we are, coming at you with part two of High Striker Farms interview. Last episode was part one, and Ryan covered some amazing topics such as growing in the canyons outside Flagstaff, Arizona, while fending off cannabis-eating pack rats, dealing with growing in the heat of the high desert, as well as how he got back into washing and making hash. If you haven't heard part one, it's a great listen and I highly encourage you to check it out. This second part is less from the past and more about how High Striker approaches gardening for quality hash production today. Ryan dropped some great knowledge for you, and it's no wonder his hash is so sought after. Don't forget to give Ryan a follow on Instagram at High Striker Farms and Medical Cannabis Patients if you want to try some amazing hash and flour Look for High Striker Farms at caregiver storefronts like Indico in Kittery and Kind Farms in Berwick, Maine. Yeah, I'm pretty much full organic. Okay. I grow in cocoa. Cocoa, um, okay. And with a drip system? Nope, hand water. Oh, hand water. Yep. Nice. Hats off to you, man. Yeah, Doing yeah. Doing the I, deed. You I, like to work, Ryan. I do, and you know, I had <laughs> me too. I, I had the I had the drip systems set up, and it hurts me when I see one or two plants failing in a room, and I know it's because either dripper line A or B got plugged. Plus, a connection to your plants, maybe the complete connection is kind of lost. Yes, yeah, so getting in there and watering, I don't hate doing it, and so. I enjoy standing in the backyard with a hose watering the outdoor plants. Even if it's an hour just standing there giving them water, it's that communication of you working mentally, looking, talking visually with the plant. I've even had a couple of the guys when I've been in the garden pop their head into the room and be like, what'd you say? What are you talking? I'm sorry. I'm just talking to the plants, you know? A couple of times they've been weirded out in the beginning when they're around me because they're like, you talk out loud to the plants. And I'm like, yeah, sometimes I just feel like they need yeah. a pep talk, you know? How you doing, girl? Yeah. yeah. Or you give them the old, you know, is there something wrong right now? Are you a little sick? What's wrong? Right, Do you right. think you need a little bit of this? Oh, let's check okay, underneath let's, these shade leaves. Let's hope, let's hope this isn't any bugs under here. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. And all of a sudden, you know, that little bit of vocal communication 
I well, feel you like... got a spot on your shade leaf. What's that? Yep. Yeah, let's yeah, pick I'll... that and go look at it with the scope. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. What is that? You yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's... And, and hand watering does let you check in. I I feel like drip systems and once again not casting any shade, but just that you like maybe sit back and take more of a bird's eye view. Exactly. Of the garden, you kind exactly. of taking a, a, a wide range view. But when you're hand watering, you're really getting in there under the canopy more, mm -hmm. making sure that water spread out evenly, mm -hmm. watering in well. Some plants yep. don't need it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you set your drip emitters for just a certain amount of water usage. There's some plants that are getting too much, yep. and there's some plants that aren't getting enough. The other thing I believe in, too, by hand watering is once you take a sprayer and you actually agitate the surface of that soil, that makes it a lot more volatile area for bugs to make a nest or make a home. So a thing like a fungus gnat that's going to feed off of rotting uh, leaves that you've left on top of the surface of the soil if you remove those and you're continually agitating the surface of that soil, you're making it a more volatile environment for those bugs to make a home in. So the set it and forget it setup, it worked, but that gentle environment underneath in the soil is also prime for those bugs because there's no disruption of anything. So are so, you, are you, uh, do you do any kind of no-till or companion planting or any kind I of... I don't do any of that, Okay. but I grow on average, and most people might balk at this, but I will grow on average easily three times in my cocoa, sometimes as many as five. What um, do you do with it after that? Compost um, it? I compost it out in the back, and I, it goes into the outdoor grow bed. It ends up becoming the grow material for the outdoor plants down the road. But what I do is I have a little hoop house... I have a sifting table in there, so all of the plants, as soon as harvest day comes, get cut, all the pots come out of the room, and that soil gets flipped out of the pot and stacked very neatly so that all of the uh, root balls basically go bone dry and are baked inside of a greenhouse, basically. Yeah. I have a little miniature one. It's yeah. like a little mini, a little hoopty. but it's a little hoopty, yeah, and it yeah. fits everything, Love and I piece. seal it up, and I put a thermometer in there. And I, believe it or not, I can get that soil upwards of almost 120 degrees. Nice. As long as bone you get dry. those hot, hot, hot days, it yeah. gets real bone dry, then you got to do the dirty work, which is put on the big heavy-duty mask, go in there and smash each root ball over the top of the screen that then collects your root matter. Now you're left with your recycled medium down below, and then I re-amend it, and I add earthworm castings, azos, mycos, you know, sometimes a little compost of sort if, it's, if I feel like it's not having any juice to it and re-blend it up and bring it right back in the next round of pots. And, you know, I pretty much will try and recycle as much as I can to that point where I feel like it's time for a transition to move that stuff. And usually I'm like, ah, it's summertime. I'm going to build a new bed. Let's get some new soil. Right. <laughs> Let's take all the old stuff and throw it in there, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I... I, and I use biofungicides and bioinsecticides. So that soil, as I feel, is kind of being treated as it's growing too. And I do feel like it hits a point where it gets kind of spent. And cocoa is no longer as absorptive and drying out. And it tends to just be heavy and dense. Yeah. It loses its fluffiness. Yeah. And that's the other thing I look for when I'm time to like swap it out. It's like, all right, this stuff's like doesn't have that. It's like a dense body. I think it's starting to break down more. Let's throw it in the bed. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, cool, man. Yeah. Um, but you're using organic amendments and whatnot. And yeah, yeah. Pretty much yeah. all organic amendments. I use the SNS sprays, which are all essential oils. So I really believe in those for keeping, keeping pests at bay if you have to. And garlic oil and clove oils and stuff like that are pretty good for the molds and mildews too. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. How much are you pulling at a time? I'm not a big weight person. My, I have two bloom rooms running right now, and I just recently got them on a stagger because I was able to build out a curing room. 36 in each? Or? And I do, yeah, 36 yeah. in each room. And I would say I'm getting around 15 pounds maybe each room. So not outrageous numbers. A lot of the strains I'm growing are in a little bit of a height requirement. So I'm not growing any of those larger, more robust growing strains. 
but I still have the tendency to throw one or two in and I'm like, ah, oh, this one's getting up there. It's getting burned. Oh, geez, too, you know, <laughs> but it happens. You yeah, know? for sure. It all, it all happens. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, that's something that I think the, uh, beginning growers need to realize is that you're going to go through the full gamut of pests, yep. uh, watering difficulties, deficiency issues, soil mixture issues mm -hmm. you're gonna have to suss out your own nutrients and what you want to use how your gardening style is let alone all the elements like light timers burning out water pump timers not working or lighting equipment all of a sudden you know you, you've been growing under the same lights for a long time and you're wondering why i'm still getting good numbers but my weed doesn't look as good as it used to look it's like, do the simple thing, do the due diligence and change all the light bulbs out, change your reflectors. All of a sudden, you'll see your yield might not change a lot, but your quality will go up and increase. Yeah. And you'll see better resin production and you'll see a lot of those. So those are the things that a, a seasoned grower learns through experience that, you know, if they listen to a thing like a podcast, they can pick up something like that. Like, geez, maybe it's been a year since I've changed my light, scratch my head and go. I should probably go do that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I so, tried to switch over to LED lights for flowering pretty much exclusively. I've been playing with them for a few years now, and I have a uh, mixed LED and HPS right now. That's bloomers. a good way. I feel like in the north, that's a great way for dialing in heat in the wintertime. Ah, yes. When you have a, a mixed spectrum of LED and HPS, maybe a CMH in there, those HPS and CMH might be throwing a little bit more heat mm -hmm. to offset Definitely. with the, yeah, so you kind of are able to keep the room dialed a little yep. better. But one thing I'm noticing, the plants consume more nutrients under an LED light, especially in the vegetative cycle compared to like an LEC. Yeah. The LEC light is very gentle, very slow growth, and it doesn't require them to chew up nutrients. Those LED lights are very, very close to the sun. So the plants are going to chew through nutrients fairly well you know if there was a light that you could recommend to a beginning grower coming he's going to set up like a 10 by 10 grow space yep. try to grow 12 plants mm -hmm. in that area you know a, a bigger pot size 35 gallon pots let's say and they're going to grow you know small shrubs start out maybe when they're three three and a half four feet and bushy mm -hmm. and they want just your recommendation on a light to go with what would you say I mean, out of my own experience, I like the the Gavita brand stuff. I just recently purchased um, some of the Gavita LEDs, which are very, very good quality and very low heat. And I'd say in most situations that you're going to get a good product that way. I've always gone back to because old school growing with HPS, but... The more I play with the LEDs, I do feel like you can be successful. And I think if you start your learning in that area, you're probably going to be very successful because it's a learning curve like anything. It's those transitions that I noticed through the years of growing that not necessarily set you back, but slow things until that progression is learned and then it progresses again. You yeah. Know? And, and LED lighting for growers is kind of what, five or six years where it's really started to gain a, a good foothold in, in our exactly, industry. Exactly. Yeah. And so I see it as something that's just going to continue. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, they're going to be doing more and more work with LED lighting to try mm -hmm. to save on the energy expenditure yeah. of growing or the overhead costs because you, you need less heating, you need mm -hmm. less cooling. I think they're just going to get more intense and more intense with the more production they do and in, in design them, you know. Yeah. I remember earlier having the Kessel lights. Kessels were little round lights that were originally designed by Kessel designed them for aquariums, for saltwater aquariums. I had a little nano cube at the time, and that's what you would put those Kessel lights over, was the nano cube. And you would grow actual corals under that little compact LED light. And those were like the first era of LED lighting that my brain went, you could grow weed under this, I bet. If it's growing corals and I have like a clam in there, and like, you know, like, <laughs> like you could grow a plant, right? Right. So it was just a matter of time before I was like, okay, I'm just going to order one of these Kessel lights and try and grow a plant under it. You know, this was 15 at least years ago. How'd it work out? LED light. And it worked. Yeah. The plant was a little open and airy, had that like sativa-esque look to it, even though it wasn't indica. 
Um, so no modern it, day bag appeal is what you're no saying. No good modern day bag appeal, but definitely good enough <laughs> yeah. smoke, you know? Yeah. And then I remember years later seeing Kessel show up in the grow shop and going, oh my God, right. those are the lights that I used on my aquariums wow. that were going now for in the grow rooms. And, yeah. I, and it was no different. The light was the exact same light. The only difference was on the back switch, it had the ability to grow, grow or bloom. Oh, wow. And the other lights yeah. that I had from way back just literally were one spectrum. Right. But it was the exact same thing. It was a bulb this big with like 35 LEDs packed into that tiny of a space. So now they're learning, okay, we take the LEDs and we spread them out and it's better. Well, what happens when they turn it into a sheet? Right? Yeah, you just roll it out and staple it to the ceiling. And it's just the whole glowing <laughs> sun is on the ceiling, you know? Yeah, that'd be awesome. That's, the, that's how yeah, you have to think. Yeah. The LEDs are going in that direction. They're going to be that much more advanced down the road, you know? Yeah. I mean, I know they got the water-cooled ones, which... Right. What do you uh, What do you think the beginning grower is going to pay price point for a quality light? For a quality light, I would say if you can afford a thousand dollars or a little over you can get a very good quality light um but i also feel like a beginning grower could work under a couple of lecs and a couple hps's and have four lights that they're buying for the price of one expensive led but that's just taking that learning progression and going hey i'm going to learn this lighting style and then i'm going to progress and i'm going to learn the next it's whether you want to start in that progression and make that investment to go led and try and learn how to grow it or you want to progress into it i think that's what i would tell most growers because i think it's how much energy and effort you put out is what the success is going to be and it's how much you read the knowledge and test things and you know figure out what works best for your growing style because everyone's style is different people can tell you a recipe or a formula to feed and do it that way but Realistically, until you do it yourself, that's what's figuring out your style. And that's what creates the flower that you grow. Yeah, that is something there. That's an interesting part of growing is that we all have our own flavors. We all have our own strains that we maintain, mm -hmm. proprietary genetics and, mm -hmm. and things of that nature. But we also each have our own style and way that we approach growing, which, yeah. which makes your flower different than everybody else's flower mm -hmm. out there. Yeah. And that's a really cool part of the community of growers mm -hmm. and producers of cannabis as a medicine. And I think that's the thing that commercializing the cannabis get, will get lost. Yeah. That uniqueness in all the different growers, flowers, and flavors is what I think the main consumers like so much right now. And I think if you look at those storefronts that are booming with customers, it's not the storefronts that are just carrying their brand and their stuff. It's the ones that have five and 10 other brands because the consumers know that those other brands are really good and want other flavors. Yeah. It's human nature. Right. Yep. You know? It's always been like that. Got anything yeah. new? Yeah. And then there's the tried and trues that people like to come back to, but that's why I feel like I try not to always have them. You know? That one's gone for a little while. It'll come back. And it comes back. You, you just know? Ha house it, the genetic, but don't flower it out all exactly, the time. Exactly. Let it you know? veg out and get bushy. And I do notice that some of the younger growers that are that are getting some names for themselves out there, they find one strain and they're like, I'm just yep. going to run it. And I see those people as the people that aren't as passionate about the plant because I can never set up one room and have all one flavor. I don't know why, but I'm that guy that has I'll have four tables in my room. And it, well, I've got four tables. That means I got four flavors. So I'll <laughs> yeah. put four flavors in there. Yeah. One of them might be a dud, so I lose out. Sure, two of them are guaranteed tried and true. They're going to be great. And then the other one, sure, it was nice, you know. But like, could I run the whole room with one of them, say the grapes and cream, and banged it all and done great? Sure, I could. And I'd probably do better every round. But, but that's not what I like doing. That's not my style. Is the spice of life. It's not my style. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. So that's to each their own. You and know? sometimes it's just fun to pop, you know, ten seeds of something just bizarre. Yeah. And know that hey, no, 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 no stress here. I'm yeah. gonna go ahead and whack the males. Yeah. And keep the ladies flower, and I'm and gonna see get if five. I get something neat. Yeah. You know? And and rest assured. Folks, when you pop a pack of F1s, you're going to get five different phenotypes of females. Yep. So you're going to get five different types of the same type of flower. Mm -hmm. And then 
that's part of the excitement yeah. of growing because you could end up with something amazing yeah. or you might just end up with something that you have to smoke and mm -hmm. it was an experience and part of growing your knowledge of being a grower. It's fun. And I believe, too, the people who are out there with seeds, the fem seed thing, I know some people still have a serious fear of growing a fem seed, but coming i'm a biologist and i took science classes that involve genetics i can tell you that eliminating one of the chromosomes from the whole genome scale definitely reduces the amount of different outcomes you can have so by not having the x chromosome you now only have combinations of y and y and y and y so you can only make y y combinations you can't make x y YX, XX, YY, XX, YY. You can't make any of those other combinations. So now you're taking that gene pool and you're really honing it in to make everything look the same in the crop. And you're really selecting the, the parental characteristics that are going to be more uniquely the same and less widely diverse. You're getting a lot more specificity. Exactly. So that was the thing that was neat to focus on with Canarado was during that feminizing process, there was always a need for trial and error. And that's why we did seed testing. That was meant sending out seeds to people to run them. And then we get multiple different gardens response to know, yes, that's a stable seed. Now, the more and more feminizing you do and the more you try doing that and you keep getting good responses, you'd be like, wow, this is really solid. There isn't really any hermaphrodism coming back. Then all of a sudden you drop one strain, like maybe say like a TK91 or something, you do a blend with those and all of a sudden you get some hermaphrodism. Well, that's the reason to pull those and get them out of the off of there. And, and that was what testing was doing. A lot of people came out with a seed company and they're like, hey, yeah, here's regs. And we got testers going out. Well, why are you sending testers for a reg seed? Right? Why do you need to test it? You're going to get male. You're going to get female. You're going to get a gamut of different stuff. So I guess in the defense of that, you're seeing uh, hermaphrodites too in some reg seeds because you didn't test. Exactly. You should have tested it before you put it out. I guess that, that's a good point then, definitely. But at the same time, I do think that hermaphrodism is a fear that a lot of growers deal with. Yeah. And I've definitely dealt with it numerous times. But I also feel like it is something that goes along a little bit with the style of grow. The more stress you uh, induce on that plant, um, and especially at specific times, that will create hermaphrodism in the plant. And that's and I, why you want to get it out there for testing. Exactly. For multiple different styles of grow. Yes. So the, those different styles pick up on the ones that are going to be a problematic one. You know? Multiple different styles of stress mm -hmm. on the plant. Exactly. Yeah. What do you think about this modern bag appeal that's going on in the market where like flowers have to look a certain way in order to fetch a certain price? Do you think bag appeal should drive price or do you think effect? I think that bag appeal is going to be probably driven for a while because we're going to shop mainly with our eyes and then maybe with our nose. So the eyes are going to be the first thing to see the product. And so I think that unfortunately you have to scale it upon those, but I think that um, having that medicine that might look a little bit less in bag appeal, but then people get a sample it, it all of a sudden opens their mind up to, wow, maybe that is more like what I would, would want, you know? I think right now we're in a, a market where storefronts have to have a certain look too. And that look has to be of a certain way. And so they all are trying to look like that. And, you know, realistically, the Poontang pie that I have is low on bag appeal. And I found that after growing it out a few times and people were like, well, I love the smoke, but it doesn't look that great. That's and the one I want to try now because... If it's low on bag appeal, but you kept that cut and you're growing out that cut, I need to know why. And it's you know? <laughs> because of the hash and the smell and taste, yeah. you know? So it's like, you almost feel like the ones you trade off on looks, it's because they have the better smell and taste. And it's hard to line up the stars to have all of them be tens, especially for a seasoned grower, you know? 
you're as a seasoned grower, you're less excited. Even when you do find that new one, you're like, ah, oh, it's it is really this, but it doesn't quite a ten on that, you know. So honestly, if we go back to talking about hermaphrodism and genetic lines, yeah, I've found genetics have a tendency to throw more herms or little nanners down yep. down low. So this is a, a little bit of a growing tip to any of you guys out there. This is just what I do. I'll go ahead and shave the legs. Lollipop them up. Kinda. Yeah, lollipop them up. And then I'll take the centers out too and try to get rid of little growth nodes that I can up the plant and keep that plant more focused on growing tops and, and lollipop type buds mm -hmm. so that I can get a visual on what those buds are doing. Mm -hmm. So that if I see an anner, I'm going to snip it or whatever. And, and the other thing for those new growers is if you do worry about them, if you feed your plants vitamin B, vitamin B is a natural hormone stimulant that actually stops hermaphrodism. So vitamin B rich is like Super Thrive or Thrive Alive. Both of those are very high in vitamin B. I've actually tried it on plants that I know hermaph. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to keep this one going and I'm going to hit it every day with vitamin B throughout the whole cycle. And it almost holds back hermaphrodism. And I used to love Super Thrive back in the day. Yeah. you know, and, it... and they've tried it in a lot of other plants too. And so in the cannabis plant, that vitamin B is definitely a, um, a good thing for suppressing hermaphrodism. So if you have a strain like, I remember growing like Big Bud back in the day. Big Bud threw huge chunks, but always tended to throw its own little nanners. You really never found seed in the bud, but it always tended to do that, you know? Another one, the cherry pie. That was the one I tested the vitamin B supplement with. I was growing cherry pie, and it was one of the ones that, you know, Canarado had passed me because he'd been doing the breeding with it. And I was like, dude, how do you get this thing to grow without her mathing? And he's like, dude, try the vitamin B. It might work, you know? Sure enough, get to start hitting it with the vitamin B. And as I really wanted to smoke some of the flower, I wanted that flower. It had such a loud nose and taste to it. So I successfully got it to work that time with the vitamin B, but kind of lost that oomph to want to keep doing it. But that's definitely a strain that I tried it and I know it kind of worked with it. So I feel like if you're a person that's been dealing with it in your garden, hermaphrodism, it could be stress related, but you might be able to just add a supplement like vitamin B, a super thrive or a thrive alive, and you might see that be enough curb to take that hermaphrodism out in your next few rounds. So that would add you that success and this not, not stress of, oh my gosh, am I going to have seeds and I can't sell my weed? What am I going to do? Do I process it? Turn it all to hash. Yep. Turn it to hash. <laughs> Wash it. Exactly. If there was one strain that you could bring back from back in the day that you fell in love with and you haven't seen it in years, what would it be? I think the one that I think of is probably the pot of gold. Pot of gold was another old, old one from the uh, Sensi Seed Bank, I believe, back in the 95, 96, 90, no, probably like 97, somewhere around there. That's just one of those old school ones that... Uh, you know, I know my buddy from Canarado has been hunting out for it and wanting to find that. And so it's definitely one if someone does have it out there, should do a shout out and yeah. get you linked in with Canarado. And you can uh, tell him you've got some of the pot of gold because that's an old, old strain that I know both of us had a love for back in the day. Nice. And anybody out there who claims to have the pot of gold. It will have to be vetted yeah. <laughs> to make sure. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> In the Trees podcast is proudly sponsored by the Maine Craft Cannabis Association. The MCCA is a diverse group of businesses and activists committed to supporting an authentic craft cannabis industry in Maine. Their motto People, Place, and Plant represents their focus on fighting for craft Maine grown businesses through their legislative work in Augusta. The MCCA's social activism supports all Mainers' legal protected access to the plant. Check them out on Facebook and Instagram by searching for Maine Craft Cannabis Association and please show your support to this extremely valuable organization.
What a great show this has been. Thanks so much to Full Duplex of Mandalorian Genetics for giving us the lowdown in history on autoflowers. Thanks again to Ryan at High Striker Farms. Thank you all for listening and tuning in. See y'all next time. Please visit our website, inthetreespodcast.com, for bonus audio and video content, including more stony stories, our well-loved blog, and behind-the-scenes features unaired on the show. We want to say thank you to everyone who has helped spread the word about In the Trees podcast, as well as the amazing guests that we have on the show. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, or download us on Spotify. We want to deliver you more great audio and video content, and your support is greatly appreciated. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, or download us on Spotify. We want to deliver you more great audio and video content, and your support is greatly appreciated. If you would like to become a patron for In the Trees to show even more love and support, you can click the Donate tab on our website, which is linked to PayPal and Venmo, or you can look us up on Patreon under In the Trees Podcast and feel free to donate to the show. In the Trees Podcast is a labor of love, and our team is committed to providing you a quality show. We are so grateful for your show donations and Patreon support. They allow us to continue providing fun and educational podcast episodes like the one you just listened to and maybe get some better mics and equipment for the studio. Apart from having access to a ton of behind the scenes audio and video, including raw cuts of myself and guests talking about things your kids might need earmuffs for, Patreon supporters also get the opportunity to score a pack of cannabis seeds from intentional crosses that I made in one of my own gardens which are for tossing in your smoothie or feeding to your cockatiel. 